imitation is really, really important because it's a very, very fundamental part of human social interaction. Um, it's something that infants um, learn from the age of 10 months, one year, and engage in extensively throughout their lives. Um, there's been an enormous amount of theorising, um, starting really with the work of Darwin, who said man is very much an imitative animal about what is imitation for, why do people imitate so much and so ubiquitously. If you go to any primary school you'll, or nursery, you see children imitating each other all the time. Um, whereas in other species, there may be a little bit of imitation there, but we have to look pretty hard to find it. There's something about humans where imitation seems to be a very, very um, strong effect. And there have been a lot of different theories proposed for what imitation is doing particularly that it enables cultural learning. It enables one person to learn something and then another copies and another copies and this can spread and create a culture where everybody in a group learns. So it's a very efficient way of learning things um, and making information available to many more people in a group. And so this idea that imitation is for learning, for gaining new skills, for letting children learn, whether it's how to tie their shoelaces or what toys are fun to play with in the playground. Um, that's been the dominant theory of imitation um, for um, several decades. But we're also finding, and evidence is increasingly emerging, that imitation is a very, very social thing. People engage in imitation even when they're not learning. Um, people engage in imitation in order to connect with other people and to show that they have a social connection with other people. Um, and this seems to be a really, really important and maybe somewhat neglected aspect of imitation that we're just starting to find good ways to study this and then try and find out what are the brain mechanisms and where does the social kind of imitation come from. Um, so to give one example of the kind of thing that we look at when we're looking at social imitation, um, people have been we're very interested in what we call an over-imitation task. And this is a really, really simple task that we can do with um, everyday objects. We're looking um, at how we just tell people, get the toys out of the box. And we can do this with children. Um, we've also done it with adults. Um, and the participant will see a demonstration of the action. So in the demonstration, they see somebody who does an action and then opens the box um, and takes the toy out. But the key thing we're interested in here is obviously I did a silly action, I tapped on top of the box and we want to know if people will copy that extra action. You don't need to tap on a lid of the box to get the toy out but it turns out both children and adults, people of all ages, will copy that silly action. So they're not copying actions just because they want to learn how it works. They know perfectly well how type of white boxes work. They know perfectly well how to get the toy out. But they will go and do a completely dumb thing just because it's social. Children will do this more if somebody's watching them. Um, they will do it more if they're in a social context, if um, people are socially engaged with them. And we take this kind of behaviour as a sort of signature of the social nature of imitation. It's not just learning, it really is about connecting with other people. Uh, some more recent studies we've done also um, look at this particular behaviour in children with autism because we know that autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder where children really struggle with social interaction. Um, and there have been very mixed reports over the years of what happens when you give children with autism imitation tasks um, tasks that are often done in the classroom or with a therapist in a very natural context. People will report that the children with autism don't imitate, they don't engage in the same way, they say these children really struggle with imitation. And yet when we give the children with autism some quite controlled tasks in the lab where we, they, we show them this is a set of actions, now do these same actions, they do it perfectly. So we know that they're capable of imitation um, it's not that they're lacking in the motor skills to be able to imitate, um, but rather when we give them the over-imitation task with the silly action tapping on top of the box, they just don't bother to copy that silly action. So they're able to imitate, but they're choosing not to, or rather the typical children are choosing to imitate too much. And the autistic kids are smarter, they don't bother to do these silly actions that we give them. Um, so again, that's showing us that these act that the typical children are very, very social. They want to do these actions because they want to be like the adult, because they want to be social. And the children with autism leave out those extra actions. They leave out the stuff you don't need to do. 
which for the one particular task is more efficient, but um, more generally it may, maybe means people feel like this child isn't engaging and maybe the child is then losing out on some opportunities to learn. They're losing out on the chance to learn that maybe doing the stupid thing sometimes is fun or sometimes makes your friend laugh or sometimes gives you a social connection with another person that you wouldn't get in a different way. Um, so we've been able with some very, very simple tasks to actually try and pull apart the basic nature of imitation. Um, and now we're doing some brain imaging studies to understand what are the brain mechanisms um, that might be different here and um, what are the different kinds of social signals that drive imitation. So how do we use imitation in a bigger variety of social contexts? It's interesting to think about how far people might go with over-imitating actions, with doing silly things. Um, little children, um, this is often studied in four or five year olds, they can be pretty indiscriminate and they will just do all sorts of silly things and they enjoy doing it because it's fun. Um, among adults, we find the behaviour is much, much more variable, much more selective depending on the social context. In some social contexts, people will copy a lot of very silly things. Um, but a teeny tiny change to the social context will mean that they copy very little and they only go for the efficient solution. Um, so adults can do it, but they don't always do it. It will depend maybe, are they with their friends? Who's watching? What, you know, precisely what have they been told? What do they think the situation is about? Because we think that imitate, this kind of imitation is giving us a window into some of the much more elaborate social processes that are going on when people are deciding how to act. Um, and again, this kind of over-imitation, imitation of unnecessary stuff, may be the kind of thing that we see in a lot of cultural things in fashion. How do people choose what kind of clothes to wear or what kind of music to listen to? These are fairly arbitrary choices. They don't, you know, one style of coat isn't going to keep the rain off better than another, but Teenagers will put a lot of time and energy into choosing who they copy and which styles to wear. Um, and these kind of over imitation again will be sending social signals and people are very, very subtly tuned in to whether you're wearing the style of coat that the Kardashians wore, the style of coat that somebody else wore, and they'll be using this as social cues. Um, so some of the main questions in the area of imitation um, is, can we create a sort of overarching theory of what are the different factors that drive um, over imitation and how closely does that tie in to these kind of cultural learning like fashion. I've given the example of people copying other fashions but we'd like to be able to pin down evidence and see what are the mechanisms that drive that um, and what kind of things drive your decision to imitate one person over another. It's the kind of thing actually even Facebook or fashion industry are very interested in because they'd love to find the fashion blogger who's the most influential and what should that person do to make everybody buy their coats. So that's quite a long way off from what we're doing at the moment. But if we can understand what are the mechanisms by which these kind of fairly basic social processes work, then it does have these much bigger applications um, for things that change how people behave in the real world. So we can study imitation on many different levels. Um, we can study the imitation on the neuroscience level, so looking at the mechanisms in the brain, putting people in brain scanners and looking at mirror neurons and other brain mechanisms which allow you to perceive actions and perform actions and copy actions. Then we can look at um, imitation at the level of psychology, um, which is many of the kind of things that I've talked about where um, you're looking at what makes a child imitate a particular action, tapping on the lid of the box, and what different kind of social cues and factors play into that decision to copy something or not copy something. And then we could look at imitation um, at a sociological or cultural level to see how different trends and fashions um, spread through a culture or how knowledge spreads um, through a particular culture and how different ideas would be imitated within that culture. So it's a very big topic um, that spans many different levels of explanation. And if we get a really good ex um, idea of what's driving imitation, I think that'll feed into many different areas. One of the questions that's very important in the area of imitation that we're looking at at the moment is the question of how people respond to being imitated. 
Um, there's been a lot of research over the last 10 years, 20 years, over how people produce imitation, what makes you imitate another person. But in a social interaction, there's always two halves to the social interaction. If one person copies, the other person will detect, am I being copied? And the dominant idea in the field at the moment is that if somebody copies you, maybe you'll like them more, um, you'll take that as a compliment. Um, but the evidence for that is rather mixed. And certainly in real life examples, copying can be a form of mockery. Um, we see it with politicians a lot, that if um, someone on TV wants to mock a politician, sometimes they will copy them as a caricature, as an extreme version of that. Um, so probably the function of imitation, that being imitated is not always a positive thing, but we're working on to try and find out what are the brain mechanisms of being imitated and how important is it to be imitated by another person. To do that, we're using things like virtual reality because you can create virtual reality characters that will copy you or not copy you and then look at the difference between how people respond to those. And so if we can understand what's the importance of being imitated, that will let us create better virtual characters and create sort of more naturalistic social interactions or equally train people and coach people um, in terms of how to make a social interaction more fluent, how to be more persuasive. Um, so there's a lot of applications for using this, but th these are still things to come in the future.